Well, I want to know how it is that you fit that mustache underneath a uh, mask, you know? Social distancing and whatnot. I don't. I'm not being safe over here, man. I don't have to be. I got like 100 people around here. We're good. So we're here with John Michaels from Black Pearl, and you guys have a great podcast coming to you. So make sure you guys stay tuned for all this, and we're going to get into it. I hear you. How's the weather, Dave? It looks nice out there right now. Oh, yeah. It's actually quite nice today. 70s or 80s? Yeah, 70s. 70s. That's great. Uh, yeah. Got a little flipping in yesterday. Found some animals. Pretty happy. Where are you located? Uh, Missouri. All right. So your area is just uh, starting with all that uh, road cut rock flipping. Pretty much. Um, went moving around my neighborhood the other day found a couple of piles of tin next to some barns that got deserted um rat snakes ring necks milk snakes right now i'm sure a lot of other stuff's gonna start coming out soon but we had snow on the ground about a week and a half ago yeah you guys had a cold snap uh you know pretty recently and it's just starting to warm up right yeah it's been dog shit here man it gives you a, you think it's springtime and then it's just not springtime <laughs> yeah i've done a couple herping trips to uh eastern kansas and uh all that. I was actually had a trip scheduled to go out there with my daughter, but uh, but life got crazy. So uh, we're we're just hanging out here. Nice. You got a couple of people out there you normally hook up with and do some looking around, or yeah, I mean, I'm I, I'm you know I, I'm as big a field herb guy as I am a captive guy, but you know um, Southern California, it's kind of crazy, you know. So it's uh, you know, but life happens too. You know, you get your job, you get your, I got my second job going and then you got a wife and kids and whatever. I don't get out nearly as much as I used to and that's fine. But um, uh, really when I get out, you know, there's a lot of like paranoia about, you know, keeping spots to yourself and mm. stuff like that. And I'm turning into one of the old grumpy people who gets mad at the young Instagram kids that uh, go up and tear up your spots and all that. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I got two or three guys I hang out with and that's about it. I'm pretty closed circle. No, I get that. Um, you know, I'm kind of new to the States, so I've been lucky enough. Been, or I got put on a few spots by a few friends, but um, mm -hmm. for the most part, you know, I get lucky on the road sometimes. Like, I got put on some good spots in Oklahoma. I got a guy up in Kansas City I'm going to start herping with in about a week or two, um, mm -hmm. and he's going to head down my way. But um, I got like three or four more species that I need to see in the state that I haven't seen yet, and then just going to start the whole process over again. <laughs> well, I know just to my little bit of playing around out there, I don't know, I haven't gone too far into Missouri, but at least in Kansas, I mean, it's just driving around the back roads and looking to find, uh, you know, looking for the rock cuts that have got the flat rocks. And this yep. time of year, like there's snakes under all of them, you know, every last one of them, man, ring neck under every single one of it. It gets almost annoying after a little while, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it does, yeah, right. but yeah, you know, the milk's popping up and there are a few things still that I haven't seen yet. I haven't seen any hog noses or, um, uh, I haven't seen a Massasauga yet, uh, you know, just mm -hmm. kind of some of the little lesser known stuff. Yeah, Massasauga in this state I haven't seen yet. Um, I seen them in Oklahoma City when I was road cruising. Um, the road we were on, it was common to see Aatrox, and we ended up seeing two um, Massasaugas instead. I'll uh, take that. I've seen the Eastern Hognose here, uh, quite a few, of, not quite a few, probably about six or seven, and um, – Nothing on the westerns yet. There's like one very small area to actually find them in. I know where the area is, but it's best to do it in October. Um, they call it Hogtober here. It's so good. Right, right. Yeah. But, I know. I, I, I look for hog noses a little bit in uh, southeastern Arizona. Oh, yeah, nice. with the, That's the Mexican hogs. And that's kind of the, uh, you know, I, I like to go in September and early October. That's that's when they're they're, they're out more for me anyway. Really nice. Yeah. Um, are you friends with Dan Eby? Uh, yeah, I know Dan. Uh, okay. We haven't met personally, but you know we're uh, you know internet friends. Okay, well that's cool. I think um, years ago when I saw you for the first time at one of the California shows, your table stood out. And God, did you have double head sable lavenders on your table like four years ago, or was that a I project? Did, you know, on? I had a I had a brief stint in the hognose world. You know, I've been doing the indigos and crebos for so long that I. I I don't want to say I got bored. That's kind of the wrong word, but I get a little restless sometimes and, uh, you know, start a little side project to this or that or whatever. So uh, I had a brief stint in the hognose world and, and for as a 
connection to, you know, kind of the people that are into the wharf thing. Um, my, my intention when I approached all that was uh, kind of go big or go home, but I didn't want to reproduce a bunch of like the same morph that everybody has. I didn't want to, you know, create, you know, 50 sables a year. Uh, my plan with all that stuff was to just immediately start making hats that nobody had. And so uh, the, the first thing I did when I got my first sable from Dan, uh, EB, who we were talking about, is I, I immediately bred it to a lavender because to, to my knowledge at the time, I don't, even, I don't know what's going on today, but uh, at the time, uh, nobody had a visual lavender sable. So instead of buying a pair of sables and pumping them out, I wanted to create hats that could make me something that nobody had. And so um, I started tying the sable into anything that was not sable. You know, so I, I, I didn't want to do the sunburst thing because Dan had already done, you know, the albino sable stuff. And so I put uh, I put sables to lavenders and I put sables to frost uh, stuff, the frosted hypos, which is the caramel and the um, uh, what's the other thing, the other gene in there? Uh, oh, man. Well, we did the hog nose thing last week. I mean, there's a few different yeah. lineage of hypo T positive. Well, um, either, either way, I did. I, I took some of the European stuff that they had and started, uh, you know, putting the stables into that. And and uh, unfortunately, I kind of uh, lost my motivation and interest with the hognose stuff before some of that stuff, uh, you know, bore fruit and came to fruition. So the the double head sable lavender stuff you're referring to, I ended up selling those, and I don't know if the guys I sold them to ever actually produced a visual. You might know better than I did, but my really only gratification with playing that whole morph game was that uh to my knowledge anyway i was the first one to produce what i called the toasted caramel which was a sable caramel a visual sable caramel uh which i sold to uh kyle in the in the uk and i know he's got that male uh, raised up and ready to uh start breeding to things now so uh, i've got one again to my knowledge world's first to my name but uh i was able to do that before i got out of the hog noses and just went back to my drum archon. Oh, really cool. Uh, you know, another reason, of course, for bringing up Dan Eby is, you know, again, a real big field herper. Um, you know, he's good friends with my buddy Junior, and that's one guy that I'd like to try to meet up with sometimes, actually get out there and do some flipping. Um, sure. He finds some crazy stuff at some times of the year. You wouldn't even think you'd find any animals out there. Yeah. But, um, yeah, definitely a unique guy. And like I said, the Sable Project's really a cool animal. We picked up a couple ourselves a few years ago, and – Kind of like what you did, but unfortunately, a lot has already been done. We're kind of putting it through a bunch of random stuff. Right. But uh, I think that project has legs. Um, you know, it's unfortunate you're not dealing with it anymore, but at the same time, you got more interesting things happening, so I don't blame you. Yeah, well, you know, it's a, I, I, my bread and butter is what it is, and that's good. And it's it's fun to kind of dabble in side projects here and there. I've got some different one go, different ones going now. But the hogs were fun for a while, and I, I really like the sable stuff. Uh, I kind of got out before the I got invested in the Arctic stuff, um, mm. you know. But there are so many hognose morphs that are sort of very similar in coloration, as far as albinos and the toffee bellies and the caramels, and you know, just that sort of light amelanistic, hypomelanistic kind of look. Uh, you know, so that's why I really gravitated towards the sable stuff because then you had a morph that was a dark morph. You know, mm -hmm. And then you thought it'd be cool to start tying that into all the light stuff and creating combos that way. So uh, that was the thinking and the philosophy. There's nothing wrong with that logic back then. I think it's a very unique morph. It's definitely one of my favorites in Hognose. Um, and I think um, the Lavender um, Sable, I think, got done in Europe first. I believe they called it the Moonstone. And since then, I know Junior, I believe a JMG has made I know he's got a couple other genes in there. I know for sure he's got um, possibly Arctic in there, and he might have actually got um, Conda in there also. Um, I'm not Very sure cool. what he's made. I don't want to spit out a bunch of names because he might have made all that stuff and doesn't want me to tell anybody. So I'm right, just going to go ahead and play dumb, but um, he's done a little bit with that project. Cool, man. Cool stuff. But um, yeah, hey, well, you, guys, you guys got some questions for him. Let's um, We'll jump back into Field Turpin later. I want to talk about that a little more. Sure. Yeah. I think that's fun. Um, Ryan sent a huge list of, of questions that maybe you can start pulling from some of them. Um, well, I mean, I think probably the best place to start is 
you know, tell us about you. Who is who are you? Who is Black Pearl? Like, uh, I know you have done a couple interviews in the past, but like, mm -hmm. um, as cool as the animals that you work with are, there's you don't hear a lot about it, you know, on social right. media anyway. So I'd, I'd like to introduce our audience to who you are and what you work with. Yeah. All right. Well, so, uh, you know, I started out the same way I guess a lot of people did. And that was kind of field herping and just being a kid and running around and catching snakes and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. I grew up in Southern California. So, yeah, I'd be out catching king snakes and gopher snakes and whatever. And, uh, you know, I was a teenager and I started having fun just, uh, you know, breeding those, you know, my, my, my dad, you know, would tell me, hey, look, you can keep whatever you want as long as it's not venomous. You don't spend money on it. You know, so I used to go out and just grab a couple gopher snakes and throw them in a cage and, you know, and they, you're just playing around and, uh, you know, they would, uh, produce eggs, you know, and I thought, well, this is pretty cool. So I started hatching out, you know, baby gopher snakes and, you know, I just take the parents and the, and the babies and just release them back in the wild where I caught them kind of a thing, which I guess is technically not legal anymore, but. <laughs> uh, you know, either, either way, I was just a kid playing around, having a good time. And, yeah. you know, and then uh, as I got a little older, you know, I kept field herping. But then I saw some of my buddies were, you know, breeding things like gray banded king snakes and, you know, milk snakes and whatever else. I thought, well, that's that's kind of cool. Um, so when I kind of started having my own money and, uh, you know, wasn't living under dad's rules that I uh, went out and bought a couple things. And it was very kind of strategic that I wanted to be able to breed something where the babies were not a pain to get feeding because I didn't feel like my experience level was there yet and that they didn't get huge and want to be, you know, breeding anacondas or anything. So I chose Honduran milk snakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I bought a, you know, a handful of those and I got some from my old uh, uh, friend, Shannon Brown, who's now passed on and um, started breeding some of the morphs of the Honduran milk snakes. And I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, you know, and, and my idea all along was it was just playing around, you know, and, uh, I was working with snakes that I thought were neat and then I could sell them. And so I started selling some of the babies of all that and I didn't pocket any of it. it and any of the money that I would make off of snakes would go to feeding the mice. And then I started producing enough snakes where it was, you know, giving me more money than I needed for the rodents. So then I would just buy more snakes with it. So Mm -hmm. After the first year or two, I never really spent any pocket money on snakes, but every dime that I would make would get sort of reinvested in reptile related stuff. And, um, you know, and then I came across the Dramarchon genus and I just, they were just totally fascinating to me that they were, they were large. They're not constrictors, but they're just so alert and so active and so inquisitive and interactive and I thought it was just the coolest thing you know ever so uh, there was somebody local who had an, an adult pair of blacktail kribos that he wanted to sell so I bought those and uh, I immediately got a big clutch of eggs and I admittedly had no idea what I was doing with them you know wow. uh, and I had people lining up wanting to buy them uh, and here I am with 20 babies that I had no idea how to get feeding and all of that. So this learning curve was really steep, uh, when it got to that point, but I figured it out. And, uh, from there it just went nuts. I mean, I, I just completely became addicted with that genus of snakes, the drum on genus, indigos and crebos. And so all the money I made selling those baby black tails, I bought a pair of yellow tails and I bought a pair of Eastern indigos and just started building my collection up from there. And then the goal became, I wanted a breeding group of all six of the major dry mark on subspecies. And I started along that path. Uh, and around that time I met a, who's now my business partner, Chris, and uh, he had some of the Mexican indigos, which I thought were really cool. And mm -hmm. his collection was roughly the same size as mine. We hit it off. We're field herping buddies. We're good friends. And so, I mean, that was 15 years ago, and now we are 100% uh, business partners along, you know, every every step of the way. Um, all the finances, all the collection, all the care, all the money going in and out, we do it all together 50-50, and, uh, which is nice because we've been able to basically double both of our collections in one, 
And uh, it also gives us more flexibility with the capital if we need to go out and buy an expensive snake or buy someone's collection out or whatever else that we can do that. We have that sort of liquidity and flexibility. And so we did that for a good, I don't know, six or eight years. We're just producing, you know, a ton of baby indigos and Kribos and not pocketing any of it. And every penny got reinvested. It was buying the proper caging, expanding, um, you know, getting a uh, higher quality animals of each of the major subspecies. And we really wanted to hone it down. So we, till we had, you know, really top notch animals of each of the major subspecies and a big breeding group of each one. Mm -hmm. um, and it really wasn't until, you know, a few years ago that we got to a point where we were grew as big as we were going to grow and we didn't want to grow any larger. Uh, and then, then it kind of, that's when it kind of became a business, but it was a, you know, 10 year journey to get to that point where we're actually, you know, uh, something you would consider more of a business than a hobby. Wow. That's impressive. That's impressive cool. journey. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we, we were really interested. One of the reasons that we reached out to you and is because we really do enjoy the animals that you keep. Uh, we had a pair of uh, blacktail Kribos for a little while. When we kind of first started R&B Reptiles, we bought a pair from uh, Brian Barczyk, actually, and mm -hmm. of young ones. Was it from him? No, it was oh, with him. I'm we sorry. Were... We, yeah, <laughs> sorry. We actually, he was, it was at Tinley. There was a lady selling them, and uh, we bought a pair from her, and Brian bought the other two pairs she had, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, and he, and he had a, a pair of adults that we got to handle. We were like, oh, this is really cool. Um, and we got them and we had them for about a year. And we said, oh man, you know, like we were, uh, every, all the animals are at Ryan's house. And so we were kind of moving, I guess we, that was when we were about to move. Ryan was about to move to the place he's at now. And we were like, oh, we don't really have the space to, you know, upgrade. And so we sold them and we've regretted it ever since. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but we've always been interested and now we're like at a point where like, oh, we want to get back into these. And so we're always looking and, uh, just when we watch some of the videos of, um, let, let's just, even the, the Mexican reds and just indigos and all it, it's awesome. So, uh, you got us really excited and you probably didn't know it <laughs> that you got us really excited about, some of the species that you keep. So um, I know everybody asks you, like, what's your favorite in the dry mark on what, what, uh, what would you say is your favorite? Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, it's obviously it. a very difficult question to answer. I, I can yeah. tell you that I have, there's, uh, there's a difference. To, uh, the question is, is it a, do I have a favorite animal or a favorite subspecies? My favorite animal that I can answer. Uh, I have a yellowtail Kribo who is, I think, the third dry Marcon I ever owned. Uh, his name's Orion, and he's, um, I think he's 17 years old, somewhere along there, and he's eight and a half feet long, and he's not necessarily friendly, but he and I get along uh, well enough. He's not really for anyone to go in and pick up, but uh, he he's uh, he's a stud, man. It He's, he's one of my uh, favorite snakes, and He's a, he's a snake where even when he's not producing uh, babies or whatever else it is, and it's time for him to, you know, retire from the breeding uh, part that he's one that I wouldn't be able to part with. Orion, Orion's my favorite snake. Um, that being said, as far as the famous uh, or my favorite subspecies or whatever, I've said black tails in the past. Uh, I love the eye markings. I love the contrast between the top part of the body and the, the black tail. Um, I think if, if you wanted to, you know, I don't know, it, it, is it call that my favorite? I, I think that's, it certainly spent time as my favorite. There are times when I'm really just in awe over the Mexican indigos as well. Uh, the variability that we're starting to produce with the Mexican indigos, and the different looks is just uh, awesome. So when I, when I go out to my snake room now and I want to just kind of, you know, do what we all do and just kind of take a look and enjoy over our collection. Those are kind of the, the ones that I'm checking out now lately. So it does more from kind of one, 
one type to another, depending on what's going on with all the various projects. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, uh, let me hear you. One, one thing that really I find curious about dry march on in general is I, especially being somebody who's been wanting to buy into different projects of the, over the years, you almost never find them advertised, but they're always sold out. You have any insight into that? <laughs> like how, how are these, how's this going down? And nobody's talking about it, but they're always sold out. Well, look, so, I mean, it, it's, th this was, this was accidental at first and then it became deliberate later. Uh, but from a business perspective, you know, this is, uh, you know, Indigos and Kribos, they're, look, they're no offense to anybody who does whatever else, but they're not corn snakes and they're not hog noses or whatever it is. They're not easy to breed. And it's something that my partner and I figured out and a lot of other people have figured it out too. It's not like there's any special secret, but in the hands of the average reptile keeper, most people are not successful in producing consistent year after year, large clutches of these snakes. Absolutely. And so with that, the supply is very low. Mm -hmm. um, there are not many people out there that are offering them. And there are a couple people here and there that produce a clutch or two a year. And that's kind of, uh, you know, what happens. And there are some bigger breeders that are kind of more off the radar that you haven't really heard of. But, um, you know, it's when, when you have a very low supply, you know, then the prices are higher, you know, and you don't need to work. Maybe this is the wrong thing to say, but, uh, you know, I I spent a lot of time in the early years of Black Pearl doing a lot of more of the social media thing and building the website and taking cool photos and going to the shows and educating people and whatever. And it's to a point now where I don't need to advertise. So I don't, I haven't advertised in years. And, um, you know, it's, it's through the years for various things that we've done, people come to me uh, to be able to buy that kind of thing. Um, and I don't really need to advertise and, and I don't really discount prices. I don't really give people deals because things sell for what I think is appropriate. And, and I don't really need to work to do that. Um, you know, to, so to refer back to what David and I were talking about earlier, you know, when I did a brief stint in the hog nose world, when I wanted to try to sell whatever baby hog noses I was producing, I had to work at it. You know, there were, I had to advertise and I had to talk to people because nobody comes to me for hognose things, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, but there are hognose breeders that don't advertise either. And they don't really need to because people know who they are and they know to go to that guy for hognoses. So, um, I, I personally don't need to advertise. Uh, we've spent a lot of years building the exposure and the reputation that we have. And so people, people come to me, uh, you know, for that, but you know, if I wanted to, do a different side project and something else, it would be a different story and I'd have to advertise. Yeah. So what Ryan's really saying is how can, how can we get on the list, the waiting list? <laughs> yeah. <I> feel like... <laughs> well, you know what, that, this was actually, uh, 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 I did something different this year and um, I'm watching to see how it all plays out, but just sort of playing with that is that there, uh, I get, I get inquiries throughout the year, you know, and it is a seasonal thing. So my eggs hatch, you know, roughly around July and I'm generally sold out by January and, but I'm getting emails throughout the year wanting to buy stuff and look, I'm sold out. Um, and so when I get in the past, when I've gotten babies um, showing up and it's time to sell, I would go to everyone who's contacted me throughout the year and I'd send them all an email and take me hours because I didn't want to be BCCing people. And I wanted to send every person who contacted me throughout the year, personal email. And then it was kind of first come first serve. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of really good keepers who were very motivated that did not have the opportunity to get a snake because they didn't respond in time. I think in 2019, I sold out of all my black tails in less than 48 hours, you know, and that was a couple dozen animals. And, you know, I don't, they're not, uh, you know, uh, they weren't bargain basement pricing either. I mean, this was retail pricing. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, in reflecting on that, I kind of felt bad that people were missing out and I wanted to have a fair way for people to be able to do that. And so this year I started what I call the priority waiting list is, you know, whatever it's a waiting list. 
where uh, people who are motivated to actually get the animal uh, and they're certain that they want to work through me, which isn't everybody, and, and that's fine, um, that I would have them give me a $100 reservation fee to get on a chronological list. And I have a spreadsheet of the first person that gave me money, the second person, and so forth. I have written on the spreadsheet, you know, who wants what animal. And uh, I wrote it all out on the terms of service on the website. And I told people also, listen, it's not about the money. This is about making sure that you, if you're really motivated, that you can get something from me and that you don't get, uh, you know, uh, lose out of your chance. I mean, I had, I've had people, you know, telling me, hey, I've been on your waiting list for like three years and I haven't been able to get an animal from you. So I, I didn't want to lose those people. So um, I told people also that if you're a repeat buyer and you've bought stuff from me in the past, then you don't need to pay the hundred dollars. Just tell me what you want and I'll put you on my waiting list. And so, so far it's been uh, great. Um, anyone who's like a super motivated to get an animal from me um, gets on my list. And uh, when I have animals in the fall, we'll see how it all plays out. But uh, I think it'll be less stress and less work for me because I can just go to the top five people on my waiting list and offer them uh, the snakes that they've been waiting for and then go to the next five and just work my way down the list instead of just, you know, dealing with anyone who emails me. I mean, I get, you know, several hundred emails a year of people wanting to buy animals. And I'm sure anyone who has ever sold reptiles knows that a good portion of those are people that are not end up, not going to end up buying anything anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I, I didn't want those people to get in the way of the people that were really motivated and really wanted to uh, work with what I have. So we'll see. It's been, um, it's been uh, this is sort of a test year for it. And so far, I like the way it's looking. Um, the next phase of it will be when I actually start fulfilling, you know, uh, orders with people on the waiting list. And uh, I make it clear in my terms of service that there aren't any guarantees. I mean, I, I, at this point, all my females haven't even uh, laid their clutches yet. I still I'm still waiting on some clutches and some might be infertile and I might have stillborn babies. And uh, so I tell people, you know, I, I can't guarantee you that you're going to get an animal this year. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will tell you that once you are on when you're on the list, you're on the list and I'm going to exhaust everyone in front of you. And whenever I have an animal to offer you, you're going to get it, you know, uh, as soon as I can get it to you. So, so far the, the feedback has been pretty positive about it. Um, and you know, we'll see where it goes from there, but, um, uh, work in progress. <laughs> yeah, man. So you are saying that, um, Breeding this these species isn't exactly easy, and I, I've heard people, you know, say the same thing, and they also say that a lot of times they have uh, a lot of issues with females being egg bound. Do you have uh, any advice to people that are experiencing that? Yeah, you know, I've heard of other people having egg binding issues. Um, I haven't really had many of that happen. It happens here and there. Generally speaking, if it's going to happen, it usually happens with a female that's got some kind of issue or somewhat compromised or she's older or, you know, a little too old or maybe a little too young um, or a little thin um, or even on the flip side of that, maybe she's obese. So um, avoiding egg binding is really more about just keeping your animals healthy and in good shape. And so for me, that is, um, I don't know, I, I try not to overfeed my animals. Uh, obesity can be a problem. Uh, it, it'll lead to lower fertility rates, uh, both for obese males and for obese females, lower fertility rates. And then the odds of egg binding do seem to go up um, when you're we're, when you're working with obese animals. Uh, so indigos have got, I'm sure you've heard, you know, the reputation that they'll eat anything and they've got really fast metabolisms and all that's true, uh, but you can get them obese. So uh, there are a couple things I do to combat that. Uh, the first of which is obviously just the frequency and volume of prey items I give them I need to manage. Uh, but secondly, uh, I try to vary the prey. Uh, in the wild, anything from the Jarmarkon genus, indigos or Kribos, is going to eat pretty much anything they can fit in their mouth. Uh, and so I try to duplicate that somewhat. You know, if you're feeding them, uh, you know, a big fat rat, you know, even if it's only once a week, uh, they're eventually going to get obese on you. So uh, if I'm going to feed a rodent, it's usually a smaller sized rodent. 
and then I'll mix in a chick or something like that on top of it. So um, adding in poultry uh, is important. Um, just having the rodents be, uh, you know, less than 100% of their diet is important. So adding in chicks, adding in fish. Uh, I know on your list of questions that you sent me, you were asking about roadkill snakes. I, I'll offer, <laughs> being a field herper guy, I come across snakes that are freshly run over in the road too. I'll feed them that. I'll feed them, you know, anything I can get my hands on as long as I'm comfortable with the with the level of uh, cleanliness and how sanitary uh, it is that I'm feeding. I've fed them chicken necks before. Uh, some people feed turkey necks. You can feed them fish out of the grocery market. You can get a catfish and cut up fillets and they'll eat, they'll eat that. I know a lot of people are uh, that keep the indigos and cribos or fishermen too, and they'll come back and feed them strips of bass or catfish or whatever they're catching. They love all that stuff. So anyway, it's not necessary for their survival, but if you want to start talking about avoiding egg binding and becoming a more successful breeder, um, you know, the nutrition of the snakes is important. Making sure they don't get obese is important. Uh, and all those things are going to lead to greater fertility, less chance of egg binding, um, you know, less chance of having uh, babies that have defects. All those things are are important. So um, diet is a big deal. Okay. That's hmm. good to know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't think there's too many species outside of ball pythons and a few other animals that do that well with obesity. Right. Um, you know, everything I've ever worked with down to boas, skinks, even a lot of the clubers over the years, obese animals don't produce very well. And on top of that, usually there's issues that, um, come up during production. Right. So, um, yeah, I don't think, like um, lives too. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really believe in obesity with anything. Um, especially when it comes to reptilians. Yeah, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Oh, ben, Ben's fine. Ben spends <laughs> everything. <laughs> you are average. That's good. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, uh, I, Dave, I, I know I don't want to jump in too much. Uh, you know, get you in here too. Do you have something you want to talk about as well? Or, um, yeah, okay, I got something. Um, okay, going into um every breeding season. Um, do you ever have a certain amount of animals you plan on holding back or do you just wait for that special animal to pop up and then you go out of your way to hold it back? How does that work with you guys? Well, it, and I, I'll get into something that was on your, uh, one of the questions that was sent to me ahead of time too. Uh, part of what I look at is, is when I'm holding back animals, it, obviously I need to evaluate my adults. You know, do I have adults that are starting to get older? Do I have adults that have not been producing well lately? Um, you know, situations like that. Uh, and then I start, I'm five years ahead, you know, uh, indigos um, take longer to become re reproductive uh, than hog noses, for example. We're not talking about two years. We're talking about more like five, you know, four or five years. So I try to have a five-year plan and I'm thinking to myself in five years, what's my yellowtail Kribo breeding group going to look like? You know, or am I going to have animals that are going to need to be retirement age? Uh, do I have animals that are, uh, you know, wild caught imports like yellowtails uh, or whatever else that maybe I can't count on to be long-term breeders for me. And that's how I kind of decide the quantity of snakes that I'm going to hold back. Uh, whether it's purchasing something I come across that I like uh, to be a future breeder or something that I'm going to hold back. But the second element to that is um, a lot of people will, you know, line breed, uh, which is, you know, commonplace in, in, in most reptile breeding things, whether you're breeding for a morph or whether you're breeding for a natural variation, a certain look or whatever else. I don't really do a whole lot of that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to have animals that are more colorful than the next breeder. It's nice to have animals that are like that. But for me, um, when I'm deciding what animals I want to hold back, it's a lot more about health. It's a lot more about um, lineage. It's a lot more about how robust and strong the animals are. And it's a lot less about coloration. Uh, so uh, when I'm choosing babies to hold back, it's more that the, the sire and the dam are just big stud, awesome breeders. And I want to have some of that lineage in future for future generations, you know, or, uh, you know, a certain clutch of babies just came out really big and strong. And I'm just feeling really optimistic about 
them becoming big, uh, strong adults. And that's kind of the criteria that I'll look at when I, when I get my clutch of eggs and I'm deciding what I'm going to hold back. So it's, it's a balancing act of a few things. It's figuring out where I need to be in five years, but it's also looking at the babies and saying, you know, which ones are, are, are the ones with, that are the genetics that I want to have, uh, you know, in my, in my breeding group five years from now. And that's kind of the thing. So, you know, less about color, less about morphs, less about any of that stuff. And it's more about just being robust and being strong. So speaking that's kind of the plan. Of, speaking of the genetics of it, something that we came across when we first got involved with Crevo's way, like it was like seven years ago, is um, we didn't realize that the gene pool was so kind of close together and connected. And a lot of the people that were more advanced in it, and unfortunately it wasn't us, uh, we're talking about how um, you could tell whether or not they're inbred or how closely they're related by the the subclaudal scales being fused. They're supposed to have a zipper pattern at the end of the tail, and those mm-hmm. get fused the closer the genes are together. Right. And ended up selling our pair and finding out that it was slightly like the one one of them was fused, and it was surprised us. So do you how, do you know anything about like the gene pool how it stands today or? or any advice on that? Right. So, so inbreeding is, is a problem uh, of varying degrees, depending on what subspecies you're talking about. Uh, the one that gets the most attention is the Eastern indigo uh, because they have been uh, limited for so long and bringing fresh blood into the, into the pet trade that, uh, yeah, I mean, mo- most of the animals, uh, you know, that are in the, in the pet trade for Eastern indigos have been inbred to, you know, to some degree. Uh, and, and what has started to happen is that there have been some uh, defects that start popping up as a result. And uh, and maybe to a greater result than other types of snakes. I mean, people have been inbreeding, you know, other colubrids and pythons and whatever for generations and generations without a problem. Whereas other, other morphs, other projects or other uh, subspecies inbreeding tends to be a bigger deal where you get bug eyes or whatever else. So with indigo snakes, um, there are a few things that can pop up because of inbreeding. Um, what's debated more uh, a lot about that is exactly what those defects are and, and how big a deal the inbreeding is. Um, the, the subcaudal scales issue is something that gets brought up a lot. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's a pretty controversial subject, at least where, where I'm concerned about it, because what I've learned along the lines is that you can't avoid, um, some defects with different incubation and husbandry techniques that I know for sure. Um, but you combine that with, um, with being careful about what you're breeding and which animals you're choosing to hold back and what animals you're trying to breed. And you can start avoiding those issues as well. Um, the, to my knowledge, I don't know that the subcaudal scales necessarily means that your animal's an inbred piece of garbage. Uh, I have some snakes that have some misaligned subcaudal scales that uh, are very good breeders, produce very good babies, uh, are strong and robust and really have been great. Um, and I have others that have perfect scales that are not. And so, uh, with all that, I kind of spent several years really just looking at that issue. And I have a spreadsheet on my computer where I keep track of the breeding history of every male and every female and every pairing and, you know, which snakes have better fertility rates, which snakes produce babies that have those misaligned scales on the tail and, which snakes have uh, tend to produce stillborn babies or whatever else. And I just kept track of all that data and I did it for several years and the animals that were not producing as well for me or had through a lot of babies that had defects, I would get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ones that didn't, I would keep those and I would plan my pairings that way. And eventually I, you know, came up with an adult group of breeders that I felt really good about. And then at that point, um, there is a, a lab that's doing DNA testing on snakes um, where they, with specifically Eastern indigo snakes, where they can give you some indication of how 
inbred the animal is and that you can use that data to be able to help you figure out which animals you're going to keep or not keep and then which animals you're going to which males you're going to pair with which females and so forth and um i just did that this year and so when i got the results back i was pretty pleased because um compared to what i with what i understood most other tested animals were coming out as my animals scored really pretty well um i had animals that um at least according to this DNA test, were not very inbred uh, comparatively to other east, other Eastern indigos, and uh, which kind of supported my idea that all along, you know, you can kind of tell when you're breeding them that when you're getting a lot of defects in babies, when you're getting babies that are smaller and weaker, um, you're probably looking at inbred parents, and you know the reverse would be true. So as far as the scale issue goes, in my mind that having misaligned scales doesn't necessarily mean that it's terribly inbred and not a good breeder. Uh, in my mind, it means that it, it is probably a genetically inheritable trait. Um, but I don't know that that necessarily means that it's a inferior animal, uh, which is what a lot of, uh, breeders and people that you read online will make you think, um, there might be a tendency that way. A lot of misaligned scales probably means that it's not a very genetically strong animal, but it's not an end-all be-all of how I evaluate mm. the genetic strength of my snakes. So there are some defects that pop up that are actually harmful to the snake. Uh, one of which is if you have a very inbred animal, they're more likely to develop an enlarged heart, uh, which is a tough thing because that doesn't actually, that usually doesn't develop until they're a year too old but the snake will be growing and they'll get a year too old. And then you'll see kind of a bulge right about where the heart would be and a little swelling down there. And, you know, uh, which is frustrating because as a hatchling, it looks like a normal healthy snake. And then eventually it develops an enlarged heart, which can end up being fatal. Um, so there are some traits that are, you know, some defects that can come up that actually be harmful for your snakes. Another one is dwarfism. So you'll get an Eastern indigo that'll grow to about four feet and then it stops getting longer and it just starts getting fatter. Uh, and that's, you know, can shorten its longevity, but in my mind, an animal that should not be like, that should not be bred. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so the, the long answer to your, to your question is uh, I don't put as much stock in the subcaudal scale issue as others do. Uh, but that being said, inbreeding is an issue that you need to be mindful of as an indigo breeder um, and that you definitely want to make sure when you're pairing males and females that they're as, uh, as little related as possible um, and that you're careful about what animals you pair together. So whether you do the DNA test or whether you have some way to evaluate it or you're getting animals from yeah, a male from a different breeder than somebody else or whatever it is, it is something you should be mindful of when you're pairing indigo snakes. Cool. Mm. I haven't heard a lot of people talk about that. So just wanted to get your insight. Yeah, that's uh, pretty good. Dave, you want uh, to jump in? I have a uh, funny one. <laughs> shit. Um, I don't know. Some of the Kribos, um, so, you know, you're limited with Eastern indigos on what you can do, but with Kribos, um, how often do new animals come in the country? It depends on the, on the subspecies, right? So the, the most commonly imported one is the yellowtail Kribo. Mm -hmm. And those are imported in large numbers uh, every year. Um, the countries that most South American imports uh, are coming out of are from Suriname and Guyana. And yellowtails are found commonly there. So, um, so those animals uh, are what you see coming into the pet trade commonly. Um, you can get animals legally imported out of parts of Central America. So you occasionally get unicolors or black tails coming in. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as wild caught stuff, it's really mostly the yellow tails, a little bit of black tails and, uh, and unicolors. Now, when those animals do come in the country occasionally, is that something you go after for the new bloodlines? Or are you just pretty happy with what you have and not really worried about it? It depends on the status of my breeding stock. Um, I got, uh, into uh, a couple years ago, um, you know, I wanted to have some diversity to my yellow tails. So I did add some wild caught stuff, but you know, wild caught adults, you know, when you're doing that whole thing, that brings on a whole nother set of issues, you know, um, temperament generally doesn't really bother me because, you know, some snakes are mean and some are not, but, 
you know, wild caught adults tend to be uh, pretty high strung, a lot more, uh, you know, able to stress out uh, and therefore become defensive and therefore have uh, a harder time adjusting to captivity and therefore adjusting to breeding and whatever else. Um, a lot of wild caught animals um, come in with parasites that can be difficult to get rid of. A lot of them come in dehydrated. Um, snakes in the Dremarchon genus in general dehydrate very easily. Um, and so sometimes you'll get what seems to be a healthy animal, but it hasn't had water in a long time along the chain of from collection to ending up in your snake room uh, with all the steps it goes through. And, uh, you know, sometimes that'll do organ damage. It doesn't manifest itself for a couple months. So you have what seems to be a good animal, but, you know, on the inside it's dehydrated and organ damage has been done. So anyway, long and short of it is um, I try to avoid wild caught stuff unless I feel like my breeding group really needs a boost of fresh genetics. Uh, and, and then I'll go and do that. But in general, you know, for the average person who wants to buy and potentially down the line breed a Kribo, I would really recommend going captive bred because getting wild caught stuff is, it just comes with a lot more headaches. So, um, you know, I charge more for a captive bred baby yellowtail than you would pay for a wild caught adult. Uh, but that comes with its benefits, you know, getting a wild caught adult, you've got all kinds of issues that you've got to deal with. So, um, you know, uh, I've uh, I've spent a lot of years really trying to avoid the wild caught stuff because it is a pain in the neck. Um, but uh, you know, I, I'll do it here and there if I really feel like my breeding group needs a boost. All right. Um. So, like you said, there's not a lot of people in the United States that work with this kind of stuff. Um. I believe, and I'm not sure if he still does, but Brian Sharp was doing a lot with um Krebos at one point, or at least was doing some Krebo breeding. Yeah. Um, I think, okay. Awesome. Um. And is it a gentleman out of Colorado? Is it Andy Watson? Yeah, he um, does some stuff too, yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah, he's another guy, um, you know, traveling a lot for shows. You know, your table really stood out to me when I was at the Pomona show, you know, mainly because of the Eastern Indigos. And there was a few other things that really caught my eye. You might have had some Kribo stuff out. Um, and, of course, I remember your two hog nose he had on the table. Um, and then, yeah, Andy, I get to see him whenever I go out to the Denver, Colorado shows. And... I don't want to boost his ego too much, but always been one of my favorite tables to see across the country. Um, He's got a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, great diversity. Really cool species. I got some Honduran stuff from him, and I'm sure I'm going to get a lot more from him this year when I get talking. He wanted some blue tongue skinks. We'll probably hopefully do some bartering. But um, no, he always had really impressive stuff. But um, yeah, the Kribos, Indigos. I think everybody really always likes them. Very fascinating, but um, just nothing I've really jumped into yet, but I'm sure the day is going to come where I'm going to have to have at least one. Well, you have to have something to do with all those stillborn ball pythons that you, you got to feed to something. Exactly. <laughs> I got I got friends with King Cobras that are always knocking on my door. So, you know. Well, like you know what's funny about, about that is that uh, I in, when you're talking about size and shape and temperament, um, I've uh, over the years, I've sold snakes to – Many people who either are in a state where it's legal to or illegal to keep venomous stuff or, or uh, some of them have, have been zookeepers that work with cobras and things uh, at work, but then they're not allowed to own them at home. And so, I mean, earlier this week, I got an email from a guy saying, hey, I really want a king cobra, but I'm not allowed to. So can I buy one of your Kribos? You know, <laughs> or someone saying, hey, I, I, I love working with the cobras at work at the zoo and I can't have them at home. So can I buy some of your Kribos? Because they're they're pretty similar in, you know, size, temperament, intelligence, interactiveness, uh, all that sort of thing. Yeah. I think creepos are extremely, um, I think it's a really awesome species. I think the first time I ever saw them was, you know, at Barchek's place years ago. And I feel like I go to that facility and there was 40,000 animals. And when I go to visit, I would just want to go see his Kribo. Um, yeah. It's always really stood out to me. Yeah. yeah. They, uh, that he had a pair of adults when we got ours. And, uh, when we first hold them, held them, you know, so we're holding them and it, this will bring me into a question I wanted to ask, uh, both of you guys actually. Um, so we're holding them and I'm, I think I had the male or the, I can't, I think I had the male. Uh, you, I had the male. Uh, he had the male. I had the yeah. female. I and, remember this distinctly because uh, I thought I was going to get hemmed up. So he gives <laughs> me the male or the female and I'm like, all right, yeah, this is cool. 
and I'm like, wow, this is it's really cool. Like I've held e Eastern Indigos before. I'm like, this is but it was a black tail Kribo, and I'm like, this is really cool. And uh, he gives the mail to Ryan, and and it's like going to, all over. Like had to be an eight in, foot black tail Kribo into his shirt, like trying to go. I mean, everywhere, right? And he's just having a, a heck of a time uh, handling them. Not that it was bad, but it was just very, very active. And mine, I was just like, oh, this is awesome. It was just hanging out, looking at me, you know. And while we're doing this, Brian starts telling us, and he had one of his other workers there too. The two of them are telling us about their worst snake bite that they've ever had was from a black tail Kribo. And mm -hmm. Brian's like, yeah, you know, it, they don't really, they don't really like, oh, let me go strike. Like, or, or like, I mean, they, they do. And as you said, that they power through, you know, whatever they're doing because they're not wrapping them up. But sometimes they could just like, oh, and they just like, so Brian got bit under his arm and the, uh, the worker got bit on the back of her thigh. And they both said that that was like the worst snake bite that they've ever had. So I'd like to get a, a little, a little story behind, um, you know, each of you, what, what was your worst bite that, you know, that you've had? And it doesn't have to be with, uh, one of the dry mark on, but just, just as a, a fun story that, you know, you always remember that one, that one time. Yeah, I've, I've got one. Uh, so I'll go ahead and jump in here. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in general, Indigos and Kribos, you know, to add a little bit of extra background to all this whole thing, people will call them intelligent. Uh, and for me, a lot of that is that they've got this crazy, insane feeding response, which a lot of snakes have. Um, but they figure it out very quickly. So um, I will often get uh, the time when I need to be careful was when I first opened the enclosure. You know, mm -hmm. because that's when they think they're getting fed and being just uh, more athletic and agile than other snakes. You got to kind of be on your toes, especially when you're talking about an eight foot animal, uh, yeah. you know, but when you get it out in your hands, generally speaking, uh, you know, odd things happen here and there, but they figure it out. They, they know immediately, hey, I'm not getting fed and they're not going to bite me. Um, but uh, what the bite that got me to change all my procedures was I had a an Eastern Indigo that was one of my more docile snakes. I mean, this was a snake that when I would have uh, my kids' friends come over that I would take out for all of them. You know, this is a super chill uh, snake. Um, but like all most Indigos, it had a pretty gnarly feeding response. So I'd come home for being out of town. I fed my snakes and I opened it up to take a look to see if the snake had eaten. And uh, the enclosure was about face height and I had to look up a little bit into the enclosure to see if it had eaten the rat and clearly it had eaten the rat and it wanted more and before I could think move or do anything I just saw the white of its gums coming at my face oh, man. and I jerked back immediately just reflex and it got a hold of the tip of my nose <sighs> and as I jerked back I ripped you know my nose out of its mouth and it immediately went back in the cage it was fine Wow. Um, but, you know, I just had teeth marks just shredding the sides of my nose and I was just bleeding like a stuck pig. <laughs> and I yelled to my wife, you know, uh, hey, get in here, you know, and she came running in and she was worried. And I'm just laughing hysterically, you know, because I said, get a camera, get a camera, you know, because <laughs> it wasn't about, you know, the blood or, you know needing a band-aid or something it was more about i hey i want to document this and so i think i have i think i have it on my instagram or social media somewhere the photo of the aftermath of this bite but uh you know my you know my nose was all bandaged up and i remember i was in the hardware store uh later that afternoon or the next day or something like that and and uh you know this random stranger that was standing next to me in the cashier line said something to the effect of uh you know i, I hope the other guy will looks worse than you you know, <laughs> it's, it's, no, it was, it's a snake bite. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, that, that was my story. And, uh, I don't have that snake anymore, but really, I mean, I, I have any of my snakes would be capable of doing that if you're not careful. So I get to, you know, that was where I needed to kind of change my procedures and how I approach my snakes, uh, you know, open first, stand back, take a look, see what's going on with the animal. And if I want to handle them, I usually use a cage hook. No matter how docile they are, I use a cage hook to pull them out. I get the I get a coil in my hands, and as soon as that happens, the snake knows it's not getting fed, and they're not going to bite me, and it's all cool. But you definitely don't want to lead with your face when you're checking uh, an indigo enclosure. That's for sure. Yeah, that's uh, 
one of the reasons that we sold our our uh, blacktails was Ryan was like, "Hey, did you see this video?" And there's a video. There's a, a bunch of videos. It's but there's your a, video, by the way, <laughs> of a yellowtail. You open the bin and it launches itself out of yeah. the bin, <laughs> like chases you like twelve feet across the room. Yeah, yeah, man. It's uh that that was actually that video was of Orion, uh, the snake oh. I was telling you about earlier. My favorite snake. He's a lot bigger now, but. Yeah, in the summertime when it's when it's warmer and they're kind of amped up and and all of that, all they're thinking about is food, man. And uh, and you know uh, that that happens regularly. You know uh, they they wow, just jump yeah. out and fly out and chase you. And you just got to get a you got to get a rat or chick in their mouth before they get their mouth on you. My, my <laughs> Keep old, you on your toes. My thinking behind that because he says that's why we got rid of them. It wasn't because we we're scared of getting bit by them. But yeah. our reptile room is about – we probably have about six feet of space in between there. And I'm like, between I don't have racks. enough runway. Like, yeah. I need to get this – like, I you need to – You got to have an escape back. route. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah that's, that's funny. Cool. Dave, what about you? Well, I hate to say it. I'm going to lose all street cred on this story. But um, <laughs> so my worst bite in the industry to date was from a leopard gecko. Um <laughs> Real bitch story, just fucking, <laughs> uh, God, I, I think I've only been doing this for like five, six years at the time, and I put a group together, and I went in, and this male just had this female, it tore an arm off, so I had to get in there, and I just wanted to go grab him, and he just grabbed the tip of my finger, and I swear to God, he bit down so hard, I thought he was going to break his jaw in half, and this went on for a good, like, five or ten minutes, and it just kept on feeling like it kept getting worse, um, and again, I know it's a little bitch story. I'm sure there's been worse, but for me personally, that's the worst bite I've ever taken in the reptile hobby. That's um, that's appropriate, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good one. one. We uh, we go, we go in with the ant hills with a snake hook because of their feed response. So yeah. like this long, <laughs> He's like this long, but it'll take your face off. <laughs> sure. But now that's my standout bite. You know, I've taken some good bow ones over the years, and some nice teeth have been left behind, but um. Yeah, that pain, man. That I never forget that pain. But um, yeah, that's my little bitch story, pretty much. I'm sorry, it's not as cool as yours. But um, yeah, mine's a leopard gecko. Yeah, the Krebos have a really interesting bite too, because we're used to getting bit by ball pythons all the time, and they, you know, they kind of just puncture you and let go. I was harassing the Krebos we had because I really wanted them to stay still to take a picture. My fault, you know what I mean? Like try to keep a Krebo still, just don't do it. Even a juvenile, yeah. But it was just a little baby. It didn't really hurt, yeah. but it latched onto my finger, and I was like, "Oh, that's funny." And then it started sawing, and I was like, "What is that?" <laughs> There's like these laceration marks, like a quarter inch of my finger. Like it was trying to saw a piece of my finger off. Like, what the heck is this? Yeah, the uh, you know, it, it, you. I heard you mentioning it earlier, kind of alluding to it, but you know, being the indigos and kribos they just have a whole different approach when they're coming towards their prey you know it's uh and it's you don't really get it until you've witnessed it you know when you're feeding your animals and, and you know and then when you have an eight foot snake doing that it's crazy but they're not venomous and they're not constrictors mm -hmm. so they kill their prey just by biting crushing overpowering doing whatever they can do to overcome it and so it's pretty intense i mean it's it's uh they they don't just yeah. squeeze it's, and they don't just wild. let their venom do their work. They have to actually go out and Bludgeon. kill what they're trying to eat. And <laughs> so the jaw strength is incredible. Uh, the the teeth are razor sharp. Um, and uh, you know because they don't constrict, most snakes they're going to grab and pull in so they can get their coils around it, right? But yep. indigos, they don't they don't constrict, so they don't think about doing it that way. They don't grab and pull in. They will literally just punch the animal they're trying to get with their face. And so <laughs> they, they grab and they shoot through it. And so that's – and you kind of see that video you were referring to about my yellowtail mm -hmm. is that it's not going to snap and try to grab a mouse and pull it in. It's going to launch itself at the prey item, and when it bites it, it's going to push it you know, a foot past where it initially was standing, you know, it's going to try to knock it across the room and that's part of how they subdue their prey, you know, just, uh, just a blunt force thing. So it's, uh, there's a level of intensity that's, that's different with the indigos and crevos than with most other snakes. I think it's pretty cool. And as a disclaimer, we're not bringing this up to scare anybody off of this. These are some of the reasons why these are awesome animals. Yeah. Yeah. And right. Keep them. Not to discourage anybody from wanting to keep these things. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's a super cool uh, feed response. That video 
partly you're like, oh man, I don't, I want to make sure I have the right setup for this. But then the other part, you're like, that is so cool. Like this thing is like right. freaking out. It's, it's such a cool animal. Right. Well, yeah. but like, like I said, it's, it's yeah, along that subject of encouraging or discouraging people from, you know, getting, I, you know, I, I think anyone's got to do their research and know what they're getting into, regardless of what species they're going to do. And you got to know everything that can happen, you know, uh, mm -hmm. feeding response is something that everyone's got to consider as well. Uh, you know, but again, along those lines of the feeding response uh, and, you know, supposed intelligence of a reptile is that they really do figure it out. I've had a lot of snakes, rosy boas and Taiwan beauty snakes and whatever else. If they feel flesh, it doesn't matter what, if you smell like a mouse or not, they're going to bite it and they're going to try to swallow it. Indigos are not like that. They, they really don't do that. As soon as they figure out they're not getting fed, which is usually pretty early, they just stop and then they're super chill animals. So um, that's kind of what makes them fun because they, they're interactive, they're intense, they're gnarly, but at the same time, they're pretty chill, you know, uh, once, once they figure out they're not being fed, which is, which is pretty quick. They, they figure it out quickly. Understand their psychology really. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you also, speaking of snakes that are super chill, you're working with Mexican tiger rats, right? Yes. <laughs> And did you, I think I saw pictures of you catching out eggs. You had success breeding them. Yeah, but I wouldn't say that it's been consistent. I'm still working <laughs> on it, man. I've, I've been trying for a lot of years and I've only gotten one clutch. So I would know, I would by no means consider me an expert or try to pick my brain on what I'm doing right or wrong. I, I can tell you what I'm trying and I can tell you a lot about what's not working. I'd love to hear <laughs> that stuff because uh, exactly. I talk with people all the time about it and they're like, dude, I don't know. <laughs> Well, you know, you hear all the stuff about, you know, about you know, misting and doing things to spark breeding and whatever else. I, I, I currently have uh, a female, my, my most colorful pair uh, from Tomalipas. Uh, my, I can feel eggs in the female. I can feel all the lumps. And so I'm waiting for her to lay, hopefully. But, you know, last year I felt all the lumps too, and she reabsorbed them or something. She never laid. So uh, I'm keep my fingers crossed. I think the one I did produce was kind of more of an accident. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. There, there are a lot of there. Th those snakes are really neat. They're and the, the Mexican ones are quite a bit different than the South American imports that you see all the time. It's a completely different animal uh, in temperament and husbandry and all that kind of stuff too. So um, they're neat. I like the Mexicans. Yeah, they're a beautiful animal too. Yeah. So with Kribos, Indigos, um, everything we're talking about now, do you typically have one male for one female or sometimes the extreme of two males per female or how does it work in your home? I don't spread them as far across as other people, uh, as, as other species might be, king snakes or hognose or whatever. I'm generally, once I get more than, uh, I would say three would be kind of the three females to a male is already kind of pushing it with fertility. Um, I've done it when I've had to, when I have a lot of more females than I have males for whatever reason. Um, but I'm generally trying to do no more than two females per male. I try to just do one. Uh, a lot of that is too, you know, uh, echoing back to our conversation about inbreeding is that I don't want to offer people pairs of snakes that are siblings. I don't want to offer people pairs of snakes that have the same father, but different mothers. I want to offer people snakes as unrelated as possible. So with that, I try to use uh, a male on as few females as I can get away with. Um, and that's kind of sort of the idea. When I, when I sell somebody an unrelated pair, I want it to be totally different mother, totally different father. You know, the two dads were not related to each other. The two moms were not related. So part of that is just building a really large and genetically diverse breeding group to start with. And once you kind of get to that point, you can have the flexibility to be able to pair things that will produce, you know, totally unrelated animals. So that's kind of more of the goal. Instead of trying to put one male to five females, uh, you know, I rather avoid those situations. And even beyond that, it, it doesn't really work as well as far as fertility goes. You really start, if you start trying to put one male to three, four or five females, you're going to have some of the females not produce at all and some of them will have poor fertility. It's just not, it's not worth it. I, I generally don't go more than two females. All right. Um, well, you know, extra males sometimes, you know, I've had a few species where I've actually had a lopsided where I've had two males per one female, just cause you never know. Um, mm -hmm. 
Will you use two different males on one female or because you're trying to keep really good track of your lineage, you typically just one-on-one? It's generally one-on-one. There are times when I use two males on one female, but I would rather know for sure who the sire is, you know, okay. so I can, so I can keep track of, you know, the lineage of all the babies, you know? Mm-hmm. So That's it's, right. it's rare that I'll do something like that. I've done it before, but um, I really try to, I want to know exactly who the father is and who the mother is uh, partly just so I can express that to my buyers, but also partly because I want to know for the future honing of my breeding stock, I want to know who are the good breeders who's really throwing good clutches, um, you know, so I can, you know, really keep my breeding group top notch. And if I'm uncertain about which male produced a clutch, you know, I I would rather have the female not produce at all. um, And so I can know who to blame for it, you know. Hmm. Right on. What's, what's the uh, biggest and smallest clutch you've had? Like what can people expect? So the indigos in general, whether you're talking about the Texas indigo, the Eastern indigo, or the Tex or the Eastern, sorry, the Mexican indigo, those three, they will generally have larger eggs but smaller clutch sizes, uh, on average. Um, the crevos, on the other hand, the yellowtail, the unicolor, and the blacktail, they will tend to have smaller eggs but larger clutch sizes. So I've had uh, yellowtail and blacktail clutches over twenty you know, between 20, 25, I don't remember what my record is, something like 24, 25. Um, but, you know, the average is still kind of more in that 15 to 20 area for a Kribo. Uh, for Indigos, you know, I mean, I might, you know, average clutch size is six or eight, you know, and sometimes I'll get a, a 10 or a 12. I think my record for an Eastern Indigo is 14. Um, Texans can often throw a little bit more than Easterns, you know, uh, 10 to 15 area. Um, but it's not uncommon to get a clutch of four, you know, three, wow. uh, that kind of thing, especially when you are mixing in infertile eggs, you know, you might get a clutch where there's eight eggs and only three are fertile or something like that. And that's something I need to look at to try to figure out why that happened. Hmm. Now, oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, this is a random question and probably completely off, but um, so some species that'll eat their infertile eggs um, are indigos like that. I've never seen it. Right. The first time I ever saw that was was with hog noses. Okay. Yeah, I've and seen that with hog noses. I've seen them eat fertile eggs. <laughs> like well, they, yeah, uh, that was actually one of my more annoying things. Uh, quick subject change with, with hog noses was that I had a – I don't even remember what the genetics were, but it was it was some kind of triple head to triple head or something that where I need uh, – you know, I wanted to have a, a large clutch to improve my odds of producing a certain look or morph or whatever it was, and uh, – uh, you know, I went to go to work and I saw the female laying eggs as I was, uh, you know, walking out. I figured, oh, great. I'll have a clutch for waiting for me when I get home. When I came home, uh, there was only the female was totally thin and empty of eggs. And there were no eggs in the egg box. And she had one in her mouth and was actually swallowing it. <laughs> and so she she had laid a clutch and then ate the entire clutch in the span of my work day, which really. Yeah. Yeah. That make me happy. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Junior has a million stories like this. We should have talked to him because you could have seen him get really aggravated about it. But yeah, um, so annoying. I mean, he's told me stories where females, as they're coming out, would eat them. Um, he's told me stories where female <laughs> will literally eat as many as possible and then just start regurgitating eggs. Like hognoses <laughs> are. Uh, listen, hognoses are a lot of fun. I don't mean to insult anything, but when you're talking about the levels of intelligence and survival. Uh, <laughs> skills and fitness you know i kind of put indigos up here and hog noses and no offense guys maybe ball pythons kind of down in here <laughs> I'll never get a ball anybody. python either clutch <laughs> yeah. yeah that's true i wouldn't call them intelligent either but that's just me yeah, they make it work <laughs> that's true that's true so one of the things i was curious about and i heard in one of your other interviews that you um will kind of gut load the prey items with a a supplement powder that you put in a, a gel capsule inside of them and right. feed them to the snakes. Right. How did you one come up with that idea and why did you think it was necessary? Uh, well, part of it was just really looking at how diverse their prey sources are in the wild and wanting to kind of replicate that as much as possible. As far as the actual substance of the capsule, you know, I'll be honest, I, I, 
I actually know uh, less about it. It was an idea that my partner brought to me, which is another kind of cool thing about the partnership that I have with him is that uh, he comes up with some really cool ideas and I come up with some cool ideas. And between the two of us, that collaboration has really helped fine tune things and led to some success. But um, I think it was something that he was, that was a, a blend that was used for amphibians or something like that. And we did that and we added some calcium and some other stuff and we kind of created our own little powder and we put it in veggie capsules and started putting them in there. And we've just found the snakes to be happier, healthier, more fertile breeders, bigger clutch sizes and all that sort of thing. And, and that idea kind of reinforced the whole concept of wanting to um, diversify their, their, their prey, you know? So that's when we also started offering more chicks, more fish, you know, whatever else we could that was not a rodent, um, you know, to mix in there. We still do rodents, uh, but, you know, it kind of reinforced that idea. Uh, do okay. you use uh, UVB on any of your animals? Are I you don't. I don't. I've never found it necessary. I haven't even really experimented with it, so I couldn't really tell you if, you know, it, there would be uh, advantages to it. I can just tell you I haven't found it necessary. Okay. Fair enough. So um, do you do any barbecuing? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm actually a little bit handicapped in the barbecuing area. I can do burgers and dogs, uh, you know. what? what you know. Well, the main reason I asked that, um, you know, when you're talking about your diet with these guys, have you ever seen uh -huh. it where they, like, take a chicken and they stuff it in a turkey and then they stuff it in, like, a <laughs> lamb and then yeah, that gets up a yeah. cow? Um, <laughs> you ever thought about doing that with your diet? You know, starting out with, like, you know, a mouse and jamming it in a rat and then jam that in a chicken and sticking that in a fish? And then yeah, just and, get it all knocked then, out at once? Yeah, and then, and then letting the snake eat it. Yeah, that's yeah. all good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can do something like that. Sounds cool and all, but I'm just saying, you know, there might be a better way. There could be. There could be. There could be a better way. Listen, I, I like to eat. I, I'm not. I'm. I don't like to cook as much. But uh, I've had turducken before. Have you had turducken? I have same not idea. had turducken yet. Uh, yeah. Same idea. I think they'd shove a duck up a turkey. Yeah, no, it sounds delicious. Anytime you could stick any animal, another animal, and eat it, sounds great to me. But uh, uh, listen, you you and I think alike. <laughs> Live my life by those rules. It gets it gets out of hand. I I once was looking up uh you know the the recipe for turducken and um there's like contests where to see how many animals you can fit together in one meal and I think it's like eleven is Ooh, like wow. and I'm and you're like what <laughs> like when you look at and you watch these YouTube videos of people doing it it's just it's uh it's kind of crazy. You'd be surprised yeah. what you can fit into a camel hump. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Um, I don't know. What, I want to go somewhere else with that, but uh, <laughs> so um, I just I keep on picturing what Dave was saying about you know with the animals and just I I just can't. Okay, <laughs> let's reel yeah, that. Don't, yeah, don't let my nonsense mess up a good conversation. <laughs> you guys just carry out with some good questions. I'm just gonna throw my. Retarded two cents every once in a while. No, no, that's 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 good. <laughs> well, listen to 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 bring that conversation kind of back to the indigo part. I mean, it's it's not too far off. I mean, you you read some of the studies about the gut contents of eastern indigos and things, and you know, I've read they'll, they'll eat a baby alligator, they'll eat turtles, wow. they'll eat birds. I mean, literally anything that can fit in their mouth. You know, so uh, reading through some of the studies about gut contents of wild dry marcon is is pretty interesting too. I mean, in and one snake, you could have a, a baby alligator, a turtle, a bird, and a frog, and whatever else. I don't think they were all stuffed in each other and set on a barbecue, but, uh, you know. <laughs> oh, depends. I mean, there, there's, um, I mean, you have eastern indigos being found in Alabama now, so I feel like if there's anywhere that could be possible, I'm thinking it's <laughs> Alabama. <That's> yeah. <laughs> could be. <laughs> so... Um, I know earlier you were talking about how some people have trouble starting uh, some of the babies. And um, so we we have, not really with ball pythons, they're generally pretty easy. But um, we have the anthills that are tr a bit tricky. We have uh, some of our Asian rat snakes can be a little tricky. Um, and there's a bunch of different ideas of uh, how to get them started with scenting or, or whatever. Um, I, and Justin Julander is like the children's python guy in the United States. Mm -hmm. and he's like wrote books and stuff like that. And 
Uh, one of the things he he does is uh, he'll boil a, a rat pup for a children's python or, or a mouse pup. And um, and so it's almost like a cooked meal. Have you ever tried to feed cooked uh, cooked animals to the to any? You know, I, I've I actually have not, and it's actually on my list of things to try. You know, I, I'm I try to take the approach of that I uh, I'm never going to be in a position where I know it all, and there's always something to learn from somebody else, and there's always a better way. And I've sort of approached my reptiles, uh, you know, with that sort of mindset all along. And uh, that's actually something that a friend of mine was talking to me about in getting smaller colubrids feeding, you know, uh, gray banded king snakes and whatever, uh, would be to boil a pinky. So I have not tried that yet, but um, it's on my list of things to try. If I can find something that'll work better than my current strategy, I'm going to use it. Hmm. I mean, you run into a lot of trouble feeders with um, creebos and indigos? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's part, that's part of the problem is that, you know, when you're talking about a gray banded king or something, if it doesn't want a mouse, it wants a lizard and you kind of know what they want. But being such prey generalists in the wild, when you have a baby Charmarchon, you don't, you don't know what it wants. It, it, if it doesn't want a rodent, it might want a lizard. It might want a frog. It might want a fish. And one snake might want one thing and a different snake might want something else. So uh, that can be kind of the challenge, you know, you're not just scenting with one thing. Um, hmm. so I've used fish, I use frogs, I've used lizard, I've used snake, uh, as a way to try to entice them to, you know, eat a rodent, you know, um, you, uh, there's a, there's a whole bag of tricks that you have to have if you want to be a, you know, an indigo breeder and have a bunch of babies to get feeding. That's for sure. Yeah, we haven't brought up quail. Is quail anything to use of the species? For sure. They love them. Yeah, they it love seems them. like it loves quail. If sun doesn't eat, you just give it a quail. Um, or at least yeah, I mean, quail. In, in general, my go-to with baby Jarmarkon is fish. Um, you know, because just the, the something about the oil and the, and the odor will get them going a little bit more than other things. But you know, like I said, some don't want that at all. And some will respond a lot better to chick or to quail or something like that. So... Really, you know, the scent that I use the most is fish, and second would be poultry, whether it's chick or quail or something like that. What kind of fish are you using? Uh, you know, usually I just use silver sides, uh, you know, which I just buy in a frozen pack from, from Petco or PetSmart, and they use them for feeding, you know, aquarium fish, and I'll just buy them in a frozen pack and do that. And what I like about those two, if you're not familiar with what they are, they're kind of minnows, guppies, you know, they're just a couple inches long, and so... Um, if scenting a pinky doesn't work, sometimes they'll just eat the fish, uh, which is good too. And I know a lot of people will use goldfish, um, you know, on getting baby indigos to feed and stuff like that, uh, live ones too, cause they'll flitter around in the water and that'll, uh, perk up their visual senses. But, um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Um, I've, I've used just fillets from the supermarket too. I, uh, I have friends that have had a lot of success getting babies feeding just off of you know, bass they catch in the lake by their house, you know, and just cutting little cubes up and they'll eat that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You ever are, we, this came up with Junior last week and something works for him on his trouble feeders, um, sardine oil. Yeah. <laughs> I have not, but I'll bet you it would work. Yeah, if you said just that intense, strong smell and flavor, um, you know, that's something he started trying a few years ago and it worked for him. Yeah, I'll bet it would work. I'll give it a shot. Also works with tigers. Yeah, that's what I, I hear. Yeah, that's what I heard on last episode too, guys. Let's work on this um, new material. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. So, I mean, Ryan I, has like this list. Uh, yeah. I did have a list, but <laughs> so the, the gene pool on uh, Eastern Indigos is limited because uh -huh. of their status. Is there mm -hmm. any way to legally kind of diversify that? Like, is there any programs or ways that you could, you know, uh, let's not 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 that I know of. No, you know there 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 are groups that are breeding eastern indigos with the intention of reintroducing them in the wild, uh, and that's obviously not something you can do as a private citizen. Um, but to my knowledge, there's never been any collaboration with uh, the feds or with a group like that to be able to allow an influx of wild genetics into the pet trade. So. It's something that's needed in the pet trade, but I don't know that uh, conservation agencies or the government really uh, 
cares very much about the genetic diversity in the pet trade. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, it's, I haven't really heavily pursued it, but um, you know, I, I focus a lot more on just trying to make sure I have uh, the strongest and best genetic uh, lead speaking animals that I can within the pet trade. Hmm. Oh, go ahead. You got something. Let's see it. I, yeah, I got tons of stuff. But I yeah. don't want to like, you know, <laughs> well, I'll take, um, I'll take a turn and then Dave had anybody hit you up part of a sting operation, try to get you to sell it illegally. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the only real, uh, when you're talking about just domestic sales, um, obviously international is a whole nother deal, but when you're talking about domestic stuff, um, the only thing that's protected or restricted in any fashion is Eastern Indigos. Mm -hmm. um, they are federally protected. They're listed as in, threatened on the Endangered Species Act. And so what that means from a keeper perspective is that, um, they're, that states are the ones that can dictate what you can own. The feds can't dictate that. So every state has a different level of protection for Eastern Indigos. Most you're allowed to keep them without restriction. Uh, but like Alabama, for example, or Georgia, you just can't keep them at all. But what the feds can do is that they can regulate interstate commerce. Uh, that's kind of more of their jurisdiction. So I cannot sell an indigo outside of California unless someone first obtains a permit. It's called a federal interstate commerce permit. And so, you know, I don't know that there were ever stings or anything like that, but, but buyers will you know, want an Eastern Indigo for me and they don't want to go through the process. And so they'll say things like, you know, Hey, I, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm in, uh, you know, I'm in Colorado and I want to buy an Eastern Indigo from you, but I don't want to get the permit. How about I just drive to your house? You know, and that's, uh, you know, not cool, you know, uh, so, yeah, yeah. it could be, it could be, who knows, you know, and, uh, I'm obviously I'm a very, you know, uh, you know, by the book, as far as all that kind of stuff goes. Uh, and it's not hard to get the permit anyway, but people will try to talk me out of, you know, um, making them get the permit. That's for sure. How, so you said the, the permit's not hard. And that was actually my question. So Dave really led into it really well. How you Thanks, say it's Dave. not hard. <laughs> what, what is the exactly on the permit? Like, yeah. Well, so, so the basics of it are, is that they're going to charge you a hundred dollars and it, they're going to make you fill out a bunch of paperwork and then they process the permit on whatever speed uh, their office is running at that moment. Um, it generally will average two or three months to process the permit. Holy it could be more. It's often more. And sometimes it's less. Uh, but essentially, if I wanted to narrow it down, they just want to know as a buyer that you know what you're doing. And so they'll never deny your permit. They won't just say no, but what they'll do is they'll send you your permit, your application back and they'll say, Hey, I didn't like this answer. Can you tell me more about that? And if you just word your answers in a way that's going to make the feds happy, uh, then they'll give you your permit. So uh, it's a pain in that it takes time and uh, it, there's some paperwork and you have to craft your answers uh, correctly according to what they want. And I help people with that process, but uh, you know, if you if you if you write all the correct things and you send it in, you'll get the permit. You won't get denied. It's, you're just going to have to be patient and wait and take your time and know it might take several months, and uh, then you're good to go. So, um, uh, <laughs> I had something else that I wanted to add to that. So, um, it's a hundred bucks and blah blah blah. It's easy to do. Is it something, oh yeah, sorry. Is it something that you need to have the buyer uh, lined up before you can get the permit? Or could you just say, I'm getting the permit and then in a couple months I'm gonna find a buyer? Like a No, seller. and in fact, this is one of my most frequently asked questions. Uh, and that is that you can't really get the permit before you first reserve the snake. Part of the permit application asks for information from the breeder about the specific snake you're buying. The breeder has to supply a breeder statement that says what the buyer is buying. And they want uh, you know, to approximately know when the date of birth was, they wanna know identifying characteristics and whatever else. So you can't really, um, 
apply for the permit before you first chosen the breeder and you've chosen the snake. Wow. So my general procedure is if you live outside of California where I am and you want to buy an Eastern Indigo from me, uh, the first thing you need to do is reserve a snake with me through a financial deposit. Mm -hmm. You know, give me some money to reserve the snake. Then we, uh, this is after the snake hatches. I forgot that step. First, the snake hatches. I offer you the snake. You see the picture. You like it. You want to buy it. You give me some money to hold on to it. And then we'll do the permit. And so the buyer, uh, the, the permit is for the buyer. Uh, so the buyer applies for the permit. They get all the questions together. I help them answer all the questions. I give them guidance on how to write their answers in a way that'll make the feds happy. I provide them with the breeder statement. Uh, with all the information about the snake they're buying and then they submit it um, to the feds uh, two three four months whatever it is later their permit gets approved then i ask for the balance of the money and a copy of the permit then i ship your snake wow and it's per the from what i understand it's per shipment you need this right correct so the permit is voided once you receive your snake it's it's over what the permit does is it allows a box of snakes to go from one state to another state so uh, it doesn't matter if there's one snake in the box or 10 snakes in the box you need one permit for one shipment and as soon as you receive the shipment it's done cool that's good information to know if you want to get them for sure right <laughs> Uh, now, last little detail on that. So now somebody purchases an animal from you and let's say they live in Pennsylvania and they decide they're going to move to Wisconsin. Do they have to start the paperwork all over again legally to be able to take it to Wisconsin with them? Right. Another frequently asked question. It's, 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 a, it's an interstate commerce permit and the word commerce is important. If you own an animal and you move from one state to another, there's no commerce happening. Therefore, you do not need the permit. Okay. So it, it, it invites a little bit of a gray area that some of those people that want to avoid getting the permit in the work are going to try to swindle me over. But, uh, you know, technically speaking, if you are bringing your own animal from one state to another and there's no commerce happening, you don't need the permit. If I wanted to gift you a snake, I could technically do that because there's no commerce happening. And that's the gray area that some people try to wiggle around with. But if I am selling you an animal, that's commerce. If I'm trading you an animal, that's commerce. So as long as there's some sort of compensation going on, you're supposed to get the permit. And if there's no compensation going on, you don't need to get the permit. And how do you get gifted a snake from you? Just yeah, it doesn't, doesn't yeah. happen. <laughs> what if can't, we you can't give them one of the midgets that are non-functional anyways? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, while I... In my years of figuring out, you know, the genetics and reducing birth defects and so forth, in the odd event that I would uh, produce an animal that I wasn't comfortable selling, um, I would generally gift it usually to an educational facility. Uh, you know, those, I get approached by those people quite a bit, particularly in the southeast, and they want an eastern indigo that is part of their education program. So I donate them here and there, but they're usually animals that, you know, I'm not going to be able to sell. You know. Gotcha. Hey, uh, oh, oh, Dave. I'm sorry. Somebody just called in and said uh, it's not midget snakes. It's actually small, small snake. Is yeah, little snakes. Little snakes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't edit that out. <laughs> midget, and it's always going to be midget. <laughs> you heard yeah, it here. I'm sure the snake will not be offended. I promise. <laughs> I don't know. Indigos are pretty smart. <laughs> uh, I don't know many indigos, so I can't back that up. <laughs> So sort of divergent off the topic, it's something <laughs> I'm curious about. Last I heard, you had Galapagos <laughs> tortoise eggs incubating, and right. we're hoping to see some babies. How did yeah, that? Yeah, so that's that's generally my my partner's thing. Uh, you know, I, I'm involved in it peripherally. Um, my partner is does all the drum arc on with me, but he also does a ton of tortoises. And so they're uh, uh, he and his wife are really doing a great job with all that stuff. They're called Rodriguez Chelonians. Uh, if anyone wants to look it up, they're on social media and whatnot. And they do all types of tortoise species and whatever else. And, uh, you know, uh, most of it I'm not involved with. Uh, the Galapagos is, uh, I, I, you know, I am uh, involved with to some level of partnership on that. And so we've been working on getting those bred in California. So 
we do have we have gotten clutches of eggs um and uh we have not yet gotten um actual hatchlings yet so we're working on getting that process going from breeding through to actual uh, hatchling babies so some of the eggs have been infertile and uh, we have a clutch in the incubator now that we're hopeful is going to end up being fertile. Um, I guess I'm, I'm uh, I can't speak too much about this stuff because tortoises aren't really my deal. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand you can't candle them right away. That they, they there needs to be some vein development, which takes a couple months to do. Uh, anyhow, so um, you know, so we we've got it. We've got some clutches in the incubator that we're hoping are going to be good, and we're just uh, part of the process, but. What I've learned with tortoises is that uh, when you're talking about tortoise breeding projects, that you have to go at tortoise pace, <laughs> go to tortoise speed, and you got to have tortoise patience to be able to do that sort of thing. It's not like the, you know, snakes where you're buying snakes and you're expecting babies in two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, but uh, they're they're a lot of they're they're a lot of fun. You know, my 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 kids, my wife, my family, we really enjoy working with them, and uh, you know we hadn't had a whole lot of experience with tortoises and a few years ago there was a fire to my partner's ranch and we had to relocate them to my backyard. And, uh, so we had them there for a couple months while we got things up and going again at the ranch. And I can tell you, you know, for being a non tortoise person, I didn't get it at all until I actually could spend time with them every day, you know, and I'd see my partner's, tortoises all the time. I'm over there all the time. But until I saw them every day, you just don't get it until you really see them. And starting with Galapagos is over Socata or something lame like that. You know, you're starting with the Ferrari right out of the gate. You know what I mean? I mean, the level of personality, emotion, and uh, intelligence that you have with these large land tortoises is is phenomenal. You just, you just don't really get it until you do it. And, you know, I'm convinced that they know their own names. They come to see you. I, you know, we had a, a different relationship with each animal. I mean, you have a level of interaction and sociability that you just don't really get. And it's absolutely awe inspiring, you know, when you're actually able to have the time to do it. And there are some that'll come and just rest their head in your lap and just want scratches and, and others that are more standoffish. And I learned once we started adding different individuals to our herd that there's a there's a social hierarchy between the animals themselves and they have their own relationships with each other too. Uh, it's just really neat. You just don't really think of reptiles as being social or emotional and having this sort of psychological stuff going on in there and I, I'm telling you, I was around these tortoises for a few years, and it wasn't until I had them in my backyard that I got it. And they're, just, they're, they're something special, I have to tell you. They're really cool. That's awesome, man. We got to yeah. get some go up. <laughs> so um, how big's your herd? Uh, well, our problem is we have plenty of females, but we only have one male. So we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're, he's, he's a busy guy. So we're working on that. You know, and some of them, uh, you know, it's, you know, some of the animals are on loan from some other people and our, our male we own. And um, so he's uh, he's doing a great job of breeding everybody. Now we just need to get uh, get the fertility issue figured out. And I think we're close. Um, so I was down at Ty's place and we were talking a little bit about these. Um, for males to be good breeders, don't they need to be like 40 to 50 years old before they really take off? Uh, I, I would suspect that's probably right. You know, we're still learning on this. Most of the animals in our herd are somewhere in the 30 year area, uh, which as I understand, again, I'm fully not the expert here, uh, which I understand is sort of the beginning of their sexual maturity. So, um, I suspect that some of our, uh, infertile clutches have been due to that. They're just sort of early first uh, breeding attempts at, at some young, young adult animals. And so, uh, our male, man, I don't know exactly how old he is. He's somewhere around between 30 and 35, something like along those lines. And so hopefully the best is yet to come. Well, I wish you luck, man. I'd love to see that. Tortoise patience. I yeah. hope so. Yeah, that's what it is. It's tortoise patience. You got to work on their speed. 
That's it. Only another 10 years. You're good. <laughs> wow. That's right. It might be. It might be another 10 years. Who knows? Wow. That's cool, though. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm just like thinking. I'm just picturing all what you're just saying. Just uh, I like large tortoises. I think they're really cool. Yeah, you guys just don't plan on being the hobby in 40 more years. So there's no reason to buy one. <laughs> no, no. Well, that, that's part of the thing, too. I mean, you. I mean, you know, it's uh, obviously without getting, uh, we don't have hatchlings available yet, but it's, uh, you know, from a business perspective, it's a whole different approach. You know, I mean, you talk about in the, in the hog nose world, every time you sell a pair of snakes, you've got a, a future competitor for you two years later, Yeah. you know, mm -hmm. as you're selling animals to people that are going to be breeding them and reproducing stuff. And I remember when I was doing hog nose stuff, people were getting mad at me for, you know, selling a lavender at a certain price because I'm going to drop the price. And let's say, hey, guys, look, in two years, you're going to have, you know, you're selling 50 lavenders a year. What do you think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the market's going to catch up to it. But when you're talking about Galapagos tortoises, you know, hey, listen, by the time, um, by the time I, all my competitors are going to catch up, I'm going to be in the ground. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I mean, I've always said it, um, like shinglebacks being in the skin community, I've always wanted shinglebacks, but the whole process in shinglebacks is, first off, you have to hope to buy a pair of babies, which is impossible in the first place. Um, they right. bond for life, so if you try to buy a couple adults that they happen to pop up on fun or whatever, they're probably never going to breed. You're $10,000 a piece. You finally get a baby if you're lucky. You're not going to fucking sell it because you're going to want to keep it. And they're only having one or two babies at a time. So right. you don't really buy a thing like that because it's going to get you rich. You kind of just get it because you want it. That's um, right. I mean, at, at some point, some of these animals just don't lend themselves to, you know, being a get rich animal, you know, or uh, rich is the wrong, wrong word to use. Nobody's yeah, getting rich like, in the reptile trade, but, yeah, you, don't, uh, yeah, you know, you, you just get them because they're cool. You know, and you obviously need to be in a certain financial position to step, spend ten grand on something just because it's cool. Yeah. You're is not going to get a return out of it. Is what are the cool prices on Galapagos these days? Like ten thousand, thirty thousand? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you when we start selling them. <laughs> yeah. You can pretty much put any number you want on them, in all honesty, and, and it's not yeah, and it, you know. Money. It, it, similar to the Eastern Indigos, they're federally restricted too. And so, it, and in fact, it's, it's quite a bit more stringent than the Eastern Indigos and in that it's a lot harder to get the permit to be able to move them across state lines. So, um, you know, so that, that affects the marketability for sure. And, you know, you can, we'll see, I mean, you put any price you want on them, but you're also, it depends on where you live. You know, if we're fortunate enough to be in California, which is, I understand one of the larger tortoise markets, uh, you know, in the country. Um, so hopefully that'll be, we'll have a pretty wide base of people that have five, 10 grand to be able to spend on an animal, you know, but if you live in West Virginia and you're breeding, uh, you know, Galapagos tortoises, you're going to be pretty restricted to the people that you can sell to, uh, you know, because it yeah. is a lot more difficult to get that permit to be able to move them across state lines. So, you know, when you're talking about the business perspective of a Galapagos tortoise, it really depends on where you live. Yeah, I mean, I've been to West Virginia a lot. I don't think they know what Galapagos are out there, so I don't even think you have to worry about that market. I can't come on. A, I can't comment on that. I've never been there. I just know it's a small state. Yeah, you know, it's, geographically it's state. speaking, it's actually, it's quite a big state. Um, and you can say whatever you want. These people are not watching this right now. You have no <laughs> concerns whatsoever. Yeah, maybe I should say Rhode Island. Rhode Island's pretty small. No, yeah, but they, you know, that's a little different there. They can't afford them. They know. <laughs> yeah, <yeah. laughs> That's so, uh, yeah, not to derail everybody here. Um, <laughs> oh, we've been derailed. It's fine. So you're also working with a group of Barons Racers, right? Uh, yeah, I've had some success with that. It's It's been kind of a, a side project of mine and, uh, you know, just something that I kind of tinker with on the side. But I had a lot of fun with just the, uh, the variation in the phenotypes with that. It's, it seems to be, you know, kind of natural color variation. Uh, in the species and they're you know most of what you see in the pet trade are green uh, but there are some that are brown and there are some that are blue and I thought the blues are really awesome and I hadn't seen a whole lot of them out there and so I aggregated a group of blue animals and uh, and bred them and and you know thought to kind of take advantage of that and so that's been pretty successful uh, they're really really cool animals as well uh, they're 
obviously racers. Uh, they're from, you know, uh, Ar Argentina, Uruguay, the southern part of South America like that. And really cool personalities, really cool temperaments, very easy to take care of. Uh, neat snakes. They are rear fanged. Um, I, uh, they're generally considered harmless to humans, but with the feeding response they have and the size that they have, you know, it's something you want to be cautious of because you never know how you're going to react to something, but, um, they're really neat snakes. I think they're pretty underappreciated. What, a, what do a, a pair of them go for? Yeah. I mean, it, it obviously depends on the color. I was selling blues for, you know, the five, $600 area each. Uh, kind of a thing and greens are more like you know 150 200 dollars that kind of thing that's pretty cool yeah i think our boreal setups right they don't have to be uh they they actually will do uh pretty well in a rack as well if you wanted to keep them that way um i kept my stuff uh in in an arboreal setup mostly just because i wanted to see them they're so visually striking um but they're honestly they're pretty hardy i mean you can keep them like a corn snake and they'll be okay yeah, they just get a lot bigger. I mean, that my some of my females are over seven feet long, wow. and uh, you know, and they're they're active. So uh, having space is is a good deal. But uh, as far as what they need or don't need, you know, they're they're pretty hardy. Hmm. Is, is so, there a species that you're working with that people would be surprised to find out that you're working with? Aside from Galapagos, have, have any yeah. secret side yeah. projects going on? <laughs> yeah. Well. Always playing around with something or other, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's it's just little stuff that kind of we tinker with when we're kind of thinking about side projects. You know, you obviously want something that's cool, and if I can make it financially worth my while, then that's uh, that's something that, you know to look at as well. And then from the husbandry perspective too, you know, some things are just not going to do well in my snake room. I mean, my what mm -hmm. we do is dry bark on. That's what we do, and so the snake room is designed for that purpose. So the ambient temperatures, the way I heat and cool, the humidity, all those things. So when I'm looking at side projects, I'm trying to, you know, keep that in mind. I don't want to have, uh, we don't do any of the boids or anything like that. I don't want to have anything that I need to have a lot of heat on or whatever else. It just needs to be happy in the room where I'm in. So generally speaking, stuff that does pretty well with cooler temperatures, uh, like the drum mark on do or anything like that are things that we'll, you know, sometimes look at. But you know, for example, just to throw you one, I've been, uh, I, I bought a few milk snakes from the Yucatan, uh, Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, as I understand the way the history goes, that there was a, uh, a milk snake that came out of Mexico, made its way into the U.S. that was totally patternless, just no rings on it at all. It was just red. And then that was bred by my friend Shannon Brown uh, many years ago. And that uh, lineage got reproduced and into the Petri. So I bought a bunch of that kind of stuff, which is really kind of neat because you get the classic tricolor look on some of the milk snakes, and then you get uh, different degrees of aberrancies all the way down to just being a fully red patternless snake, which is a lot of fun too. So there's an example of something that I can keep easily in the way I have my reptile room set up, um, but uh, that should have some financial profitability for me when I'm reproducing them. We'll see. Um, but also just really cool stuff that just piques my interest. Right on. That's important. Um, okay, so I don't know if you've had the opportunity to go to South America to do any herping yet. Um, and if you haven't, is that something on your list? I have. Uh, I, it, I generally am not super interested for whatever reason with Asian stuff, whether it's field herping or – or captive stuff. I, I think a lot of the Asian rats are really cool. You guys were talking about that earlier, but I've never really worked with them. Uh, I just tend to be drawn towards new world type stuff. Uh, and that goes for field herping as well. So I've been to Costa Rica many times. Uh, I was just in Nicaragua uh, a few months ago before all this craziness happened. And, um, you know, Panama, Peru, Ecuador. Uh, yeah, I love traveling to all those areas. And some of it is just family travel. Some of it's, uh, you know, not herping related, but I try to get out and, you know, come across whatever critters I can find when I'm down there. Yeah. How often do you actually hit your target species? Uh, target species is a tough one. One of the cool <laughs> things about the tropics, man, is that, is that there are, there is so much more diversity than most places in the U S that you can, 
you could be hiking on a trail at night and you you have no idea what you're about to come across. And that's kind of the allure of it. So, um, you know, there are a lot of super common things that I've never found. You just didn't get lucky and come across it. And, and then I've come across some really cool stuff that's not commonly seen. One of my first snakes that I found in Costa Rica, which I really dug, was uh, Musarana. And, uh, you know, I was walking through a stream at night, you know, ankle deep in water. And I saw just a, a ripple in the water up in front of me. And, and it was, this was a six and a half foot snake that was swimming in the water, uh, downstream, right down the center. And it just swam right into my hands. And I just picked him up gently. And, and that was just a, a magical experience. This super cool snake. I went home and I invested in some and bred those for a while too. So, uh, yeah, I mean, target species that I have not yet come across. I mean, I'd love to see a Bushmaster, you know, yeah. but that's the top of a lot of people's list, you know, haven't, haven't really made a concerted effort to go after them, but that'd be fun. And then there are things that are just difficult to target, like bromeliad boas, for example, in Central America, if you're familiar with those, the genus is uh, Ungaliophus. Um, yeah, I would love to find one of those. I would have no clue how to even target those, but it's kind of one of those things you have to stumble across. Fun. Fun. Man. So how, uh, how did you come up with the name black pearl? That actually goes back to the Musarana. Um, I used to breed one of the, my early breeding projects were Musarana that I was importing out of Uruguay. Um, and if you're not familiar with Musarana, it's a colubrid that gets to be six to eight feet long. Uh, they're kind of built like a king snake or a milk snake, but they're uh, rear fanged and they're natural snake eaters in the wild. And it's, you kind of get my, my taste in snakes and that they're, they're big, they're powerful, they're strong, they're active. And, uh, I kind of fell in love with those after I caught that one in Costa Rica. So I started importing some, um, it's a different type of Musarana, but out of Uruguay and the guy I was getting them from had a piebald gene that was going on in them. And so you had this, you know, six, seven foot long snake that was jet black but then it would have white splotches throughout the whole thing up and down it. So it had this sort of cow, dairy cow kind of a look. And uh, that's kind of where the black pearl thing came from. Wow. That has nothing to do with Johnny Depp. Oh, no pirates <laughs> or anything. I was wondering. Uh, I'm kind of sad now. <laughs> yeah, well, there, there is a book called the, the Curse of the Black Pearl, which is kind of fun. It's, uh, it's a good read of mine. It's about uh, diving for pearls in, uh, in, in Baja. Yeah, I probably won't read it, but you can tell us more about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know that you're really interested. I sense a little bit of uh, sarcasm on your on your end there. Well, I know you're focusing on me right now, but if you looked at those two guys after you mentioned that, they looked very disinterested, also. So don't put this on me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's why I'm not going to tell you more about it. I'm sure a lot of the listeners aren't going to go uh, go out and pick it up from Amazon. I'm uh, downloading it right now. It's on Audible, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Uh, I'm always up for that kind of thing, actually. So it's yeah, it's I, not really out of my realm of uh, books I listen to. Um, I think we hit all my topics. So yeah, yeah, we're we're coming in on uh, two hours here, and uh, so I don't know, Dave, if you have uh, anything else that you're like, hey, I really want to know, or um, yeah, a lot of pressure, like always. I don't know why he's not giving me at the end. Um, no, honestly, I think this is awesome. Um, you know, like I said, I only experienced seeing your table a couple times at the shows, and you know, I barely even got to talk to you when I did see you. But um, yeah, this was awesome. You know, I definitely enjoyed all this. Um, you know, it's Crebos are definitely one. I, I love Eastern Indigos, but Crebos just because the experience I had with a couple of hell, I've always really been fascinated with them, but just never bit the bullet and buying one yet. But I um, hear you. Well, there's time. We're, we're well, I got I got a guy now, so um, you know you I'm go, gonna. You got a guy, you know a guy. Yeah. yeah. Um. All right, and then yeah, I just said you know like you like a bunch of diverse animals. Have you ever thought about getting into like land mullets? Huh? I'm sorry. Say that again. <laughs> land mullets. <laughs> land mullets. Is that a hairdo? <laughs> it's a band from the '80s. It's uh, <laughs> no, they're really cool skinks, man. I just... Anyway. Um, he's not a lizard guy. Man. I know. <laughs> yeah, the, lizards are what I know the least about. <laughs> he uses them to feed to his indigos. Yeah, that's, <laughs> probably. That's, that's probably usually the that. joke I have. Yeah, it, it, if you, yeah, sure. Send send me some my way. My indigos are hungry. <laughs> mm. If I had land mullets, I wouldn't. 
Yeah. Uh, and leftover ball pythons, whatever. Sounds uh, like a plan. We, uh, can, we can have a trade here. If you need ball pythons, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. My snakes are hungry. They're always hungry. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Um, this was actually really fun for us. And I don't know if, uh, if you got, you got that uh, intensity because we, we just are really interested in the dry mark on. So um, very fascinated and I appreciate you coming on. Uh, this was great. Especially taking two hours out of your time, man. This is a long freaking conversation. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's these, it, it's funny. You, you get, you get reptile guys talking it, uh, it, it time flies pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe after all this is done, maybe we could do a, a herpin trip or something, Dave. If we can, I, I was thinking about this actually uh, the last few days because Dave's Dave drives all over the place to do herping, and um, just with the the amount of people, we should probably do like once all this craziness is over, do like a, a trip, Dave, where we just have like you know maybe ten friends or or whatever, just kind of go and 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 turn some rocks, you know. Everyone yeah. made at Dave's house. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like a lot of people go in all the secret places, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> I mean, if you do get the city trip again or head out to, um, like you said, East Kansas, let me know. Uh, I'll come blindfolded. We'll hang out a little bit. I won't talk about it. I won't take any pictures. There you go. <laughs> right on, guys. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, man. All right. Thanks. So make sure uh, everybody else that's watching uh, like this video if you liked it and subscribe and hit the notification bell. It's all that social media stuff. And uh, get yeah. on this guy's waiting list because it's going to take you five years. Yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you so much.